This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. As we turn to Afghanistan, on Wednesday, Taliban fighters attacked the capital of the Afghan province of Bajis as part of an escalating Taliban offensive in northern and northwest Afghanistan. The Taliban now controls roughly a third of all 421 districts and district centers in Afghanistan. The Taliban offensive comes as the U.S. and NATO forces are withdrawing from the country after nearly 20 years of fighting. U.S. Central Command estimates the U.S. withdrawal is 90 percent complete. Last week, the U.S. military left Bagram Airfield, a key center of command in America's longest war. An Afghan official said U.S. forces did not coordinate the departure with local authorities, resulting in a period of looting at the airbase before Afghan forces took over control. As the U.S. winds down its withdrawal from Afghanistan, at least 650 troops are expected to remain to secure the U.S. embassy in Kabul. In addition, The New York Times has reported the U.S. will maintain a, quote, shadowy combination of clandestine special operations forces, <clears throat> Pentagon contractors and covert intelligence operatives. President Biden is scheduled to speak about Afghanistan today. Meanwhile, representatives of the Taliban and the Afghan government met in Iran today for high-level peace talks. In a joint statement, the two sides said, quote, war is not the solution to the Afghanistan problem. We're joined now by two guests. Seema Samar is with us, a longtime Afghan women and human rights defender, served as Minister of Women's Affairs of Afghanistan from 2001 to 2003. In 2012, she was awarded the Right Livelihood Award over her advocacy for women's rights. She's joining us from Houston, Texas. And joining us from Afghanistan is Ali Latifi, freelance journalist based in Kabul. His recent piece for Al Jazeera headlined, Afghans say recent Taliban advances forced them to take up arms. Let's begin in Kabul with Ali. Can you describe what you are seeing on the ground? According to Al Jazeera, what, 30 percent of the country now in uh, under Taliban control is do you find that you can actually actually verify this? It's hard to verify these statistics because, for one thing, a lot of these districts are often trading hands. You know, they go back and forth. Um, and this is something that's been going on for years. You know, the difference is that in the past, this, this kind of um, cat and mouse game took weeks or months, sometimes even years. Now it's in a matter of days where you know, you'll get a report that this district fell to the Taliban, and then two, three, four days later, they say that it was regained by the government. Um, in the last week, I've been to two different, well, including Kabul, three different provinces of the country. Um, you know, I've met with people who are part of these local uprising forces, which is what I wrote about for the Al Jazeera story. I met with security forces. I met with officials, including provincial governors. Um, and they're really putting a lot of weight behind these uprising movements, saying that they want to, they are supportive of actual people uh, trying to defend their own areas, of taking guns that were all, all either already in their homes, left over from the Civil War or the Taliban time when they were hiding these guns, or even the current uh, last 20 years when disarmament kind of went awry, was never really successful, um, or in some cases are handing out new guns to them, uh, because the idea is that they want to show the Taliban that the people are A, against them, B, supporting the national security forces, and that C, they are willing to fight against them, uh, against the Taliban. So it, it's really a big gamble at this moment. Ali, can you uh, explain why you're concerned about this, the fact that uh, former Mujahideen, as well as many other volunteers, uh, are taking up arms, uh, what you wrote about? What do you fear might happen? I, I, it's not necessarily my fear. It, it, it's a fear that's permeating. Look, there are plenty of people that support, absolutely 100 percent support these uprisings because they think it's localizing security, it's bringing power back to the people. But then there are some people who fear that, you know, if you're handing out all of these guns, A, can you get them back when you, when you, when you supposedly won the war or, you know, reached uh, your goal of somehow getting rid of the Taliban? 
And B, can you make sure that these people will not turn their guns against the people of these areas? Because in some areas that we went, you know, the people that were part of these uprisings, they may have been from the same province or the same region, but they weren't necessarily from the same exact district or the same exact area as where they were fighting in. So there are questions, will this lead to tensions? And could we end up in a situation like 1992 where, you know, all of these armed movements essentially turned their guns against each other and there were rockets raining down on Kabul. The entire city was divided along ethnic lines and, and um lines according to to their allegiance to different armed groups and you know the city was ghettoized and there was all kinds of um in a way lawlessness you know at that time which is what eventually led to the taliban coming to power so that's really the fear that people have is can you control this when you need to and uh, Dr. Seema Samar, you were uh, the Minister for Women's Affairs uh, in, from 2001 to 2003, uh, that is, uh, following the installation of the government uh, after the U.S. Uh, invasion. Could you talk about your concerns uh, regarding uh, the Taliban, the Taliban, as we've discussed, reportedly in charge of a third of districts across Afghanistan? Uh, and also the broader effects of the withdrawal of U.S. and foreign troops from the country. Uh, good morning to you and uh, good morning to your listeners. I think the, uh, let me crack the, I was Minister of Women's Affairs for only for six months, but then I was, uh, for a long time, I was the chairperson of Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission, which was uh, also one of the, uh, an institution, I would say that, uh, that one of the success stories of the country, uh, which done the uh, promotion and protection of human rights and continue to do the same work. Um, I think, as as uh, my colleague said, um, the 30 percent of the the country or district is under control of the Taliban, but the people are not supportive of their presence. Uh, it used to be uh, exchange of districts uh, between the two uh, conflict uh, uh, warring factions, but uh, this time they are more rapid. It is concerned because we don't know what will happen, but the, the concern of the people, but more people are displaced and it's a lot of violence which push the people out of their homes. And the, pe the country is already, the people are, are already poor and the, the um, economy is not in a very good shape. So it is a concern of uh, more displacement, more poverty, more tension. Uh, and the, uh, on the issue of uh, people uprising and protection or supporting uh, or standing against Taliban, uh, the problem is that it requires a proper management, as uh, the previous speaker already said. If it's not managed properly, the people of Afghanistan doesn't have a good experience with that kind of uprising. And it, I hope it will, it will not create any ethnic and, and political tension between the people who are against Taliban. But I think the, the issue is that clearly it was not really, uh, um, the withdrawal was not in the right time. At least it should have done after a ceasefire between the different uh, political uh, parties or the different groups, warring faction uh, in the country. So that has not happened, unfortunately. And I think the other issue is that, of course, uh, Afghanistan should not be abandoned because we had the experience before, which was uh, end up with the uh, serious attack on the U.S. Uh, soil. And if that has happened, then it will be another disaster, not only for the Afghans, but for everybody around the world. <coughs> Dr. Seema Samar, I wanted to get your response to the Taliban spokesperson, Suhail Shaheen, talking about the Taliban's position on women's rights on CNN just a few weeks ago. We are not uh, against uh, the basic rights of women, that is, education and their work. 
only because we are an Islamic society, they have to uh, observe the Islamic hijab. Uh, even now, if you see, you go to the Kabul city, uh, the women are observing hijab voluntarily by themselves because they are uh, this uh, uh, different uh, culture, Afghan culture and Islamic uh, culture. He was speaking on uh, Fareed Zakaria's GPS on CNN. <clears throat> Dr. Seema Samar, can you respond to what he has said, and also talk about the uh, talks that are going on right now in Iran between the Taliban and the Afghan government? And previously, it was in Doha, but that wasn't including the Afghan government. And where women stand in all of this? Uh, well, I think on the on the stand of the uh, of the Taliban spokesperson that they respect the basic human rights. Why not all of the human rights, not only education and and their work? Uh, and he, as he said, that the Afghan women already pre respecting hijab. Then why, why? What is their problem? actually. And it's the same thing that they said when they were in power in Afghanistan uh, from 1996 to 2001. Uh, I think they have to show uh, uh, in action, because the areas which is under control of Taliban, uh, they have not shown this, uh, the, the, the changes that they claim that they have been changed and they are respecting the women's rights. Unfortunately, women are, are beaten up and, and, and simple issues. Uh, violating their basic human rights. That is uh, uh, one issue. The second point, the second question that you ask, I think that the, in the Tehran talks, you see that there is no woman at all. And um, in Doha, we are not satisfied with uh, having four women in the, in the peace talks among the um, 42 men, but they choose the 42, the number, because it was 42 years of war, but now it's 43 years of war, uh, and it's going to be 44, unfortunately. Uh, I, I think, I personally believe that there is no harm if they really sit and talk, but it should be inclusive. It should be coordinated. Everybody should not, I mean, somebody is sitting in Moscow, somebody is sitting in, in Doha, somebody is sitting in another part of the world, in China or in Iran. But it should be coordinated and it should be a way to get out of this problem. Uh, and Afghan, Afghan people should realize that they are responsible for their country and they should come to uh, a an idea and, and a plan that they to end the war in the country. It's very violent, and we people keep losing life every day. And what do Afghan and, women need most right now, Seema? Well, I think they, they need recognition. They have to be recognized, first of all, and then they have to be included in the process. And then uh, with inclusion, and of course, it, they should be supported, not giving their name in some position, but they are not, they will not get financial and political support. So that is really important that our existence should be recognized in the country as a half of the population and we should be included in all the policy, all, all the uh, issues and, and in relation of the country and the, the, and the people and the uh, social and the cultural and the peace process. Uh, and the peace building and implementation of peace agreement in case we reach to uh, a peace agreement. Ali Latifi, uh, you know, people have pointed out that the war uh, in Afghanistan uh, has been, uh, that there have been uh, foreign countries involved in addition uh, to the U.S. The U.S. was not the only one. Could you speak specifically about the involvement of uh, uh, Pakistan and its continuing alleged support uh, for the Taliban? The Prime Minister Imran Khan giving an interview to The New York Times recently saying that whatever leverage uh, his uh, government had with the Taliban has vanished uh, uh, once the U.S. announced its withdrawal because the Taliban took that withdrawal as a sign of its victory. Well, I think just the fact that Imran Khan admits to the New York Times that his government had even 1% of leverage with the Taliban should say a lot. 
Um, you know, the fact that, and it's not just Pakistan, this is why it's ironic that the talks are happening in Tehran as well, is that we've gotten clear proof on the ground that Pakistan and Iran are very heavily involved with the Taliban, are aiding them, are abetting them, are supplying them, are providing them safe haven. Um, you know, they're, they're, I mean, they're, there's literal on the ground evidence. When you talk to police in different provinces, they will say that we found uh, weapons and ammunition that was very clearly coming from Pakistan or from Iran. Um, you know, people will talk about the presence of Iranian Pakistani fighters on the ground. You know, I talked to uh, an MP from the western province of, of uh, Farah about a year ago, uh, a few months ago, and he was saying that when he was in charge of security in the south and the west, when he was working in security in the south and the west, he saw Irani fighters standing aside the Taliban. And people will say the same thing about Pakistanis. And then there's clear evidence, for instance, when Mullah Mansour, the second leader of the Taliban, was still alive, there was footage of him going through the Karachi airport to go to Iran, and I believe also the Emirates. You know, there were pictures of different Pakistani leaders living in uh, the, 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 the areas around the Duran line. Um, you know, the fact that Osama bin Laden, if the whole point of this war was about al-Qaeda and 9-11 and bin Laden, he was found in Abbottabad, you know, I mean, the the, the, the statement that, that the media always uses is that he was found uh, near the Pakistani equivalent of West Point, and yet there is no real pressure ever being put on Pakistan, right? If, if Imran Khan says, I have very little or no leverage against uh, the Taliban, the question then comes, why isn't Washington and Berlin and London and Paris and all these other places asking him, well, when did you have leverage over the Taliban? Why did you have leverage over the Taliban? And why have you not been doing anything to exercise that leverage in a positive way? Um, and this is something that, you know, upsets everyone in Afghanistan because, as I said, there's there's documented proof, both on the ground here and just things like pictures and footage uh, that show that, you know, Pakistan has a very active role and Iran uh, in supporting the, the Taliban, and yet there's no real ever pressure, physical, real pressure being put on Pakistan because of it. And Ali Latifi, today uh, President Biden will be addressing the issue of Afghanistan. Uh, it's been almost 20 years, uh, the mm -hmm. United States' longest war. Talk about the results of the U.S. invasion and occupation on Afghanistan. I, I was just reading today, there was a headline that the U.S. is considering giving visas and support to Afghan women and rights activists and journalists who may feel in danger after the U.S. withdrawal. And I think just that headline enough says, you know, if in 2001, George Bush's entire justification and, you know, he paraded Laura Bush around as well and, you know, Hillary Clinton, when she became secretary of state, you know, went on these uh, speaking tours and, and, and came on these missions and kept talking about things like human rights and women's rights and so on and so forth. And yet, literally in 2021, two months before their withdrawal, we have a headline saying they may have to evacuate, you know, thousands of women and rights workers 20 years after uh, their invasion of the country, allegedly, you know, to support women, to reestablish human rights, to reestablish democracy. I think that in itself says everything. Well, we want to thank you both for joining us. Uh, Ali Latifi, freelance reporter based in Kabul, will link to your Al Jazeera piece um, headlined, Afghans say recent Taliban advances forced them to take up arms. And we want to thank Dr. Seema Samar, Afghan women and human rights defender. As we turn now to why the Palestinian Authority is cracking down on Palestinian demonstrators in the occupied West Bank, we'll go to Ramallah. Stay with us.